Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second quarter uh, Inland Empire Innovation Showcase. My name is Gary Retberg, and I'm the research manager at the Center for Social Innovation at UC Riverside. Um, please feel free to drop your name and affiliation in the chat so that we know you're here. Uh, you can make comments and ask questions in the chat as well as we go through the agenda. Um, so actually, Eric, could you go to the next slide, please? So this is the second installment of the Innovation Showcase. Uh, the idea is to highlight innovators and entrepreneurs that have an impact on our region. So there's a ton of work happening in the innovation space in the IE. And we want to do our part to highlight that work and also provide some data and research that can help to shed light on different aspects of the ecosystem. Um, so exactly one year today, I just realized this morning, we released our state of innovation in the Inland Empire report, um, which had a ton of data and dug pretty deep into some of the different innovation sectors. Um, so today, in partnership with Stacy Cumberbatch from Blended Impact, uh, we'll be presenting a few updates in terms of different things that have happened since the release of the report and some, some updated data. Um, then we'll be hearing from both Caravanserai Project and Fourth Sector Innovations about their work. Um, of course, after each presentation, feel, please feel free to ask questions. You can drop them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and then after the discussion, we'll wrap it up and talk about some next steps and kind of where we go from here. Um, so before we get started and all that, I'd like to introduce our center director, Dr. Karthik Ramakrishnan, who will help us to kind of set the stage a little and talk a little bit more about the IE innovation ecosystem. Karthik. Thank you, Gary, and thank you everyone uh, for, for being here and for your continued support for the IE innovation ecosystem. Uh, and for our um, innovators or capacity builders, including those you'll hear from today. Um, I'll just, uh, just want to uh, thank uh, both Gary and Stacy's uh, leadership in, uh, in terms of the data and research that you'll see um, today, um, as well as uh, you, I'll be tossing it over to Sarah Wright, uh, one of our newest team members. Uh, she's one of our community engagement leads. Uh, and uh, has uh, support for the innovation ecosystem uh, in her portfolio. Uh, Sarah will talk about this innovation homecoming, uh, which is a brand new idea to think about having a homecoming of innovators, not only for a particular high school or a particular community college or four-year college, but what does it mean to have an innovation homecoming for an entire region? We hope that this will be the beginning of many steps we take to be that beacon and bring back uh, folks who might have gone to some other parts of the state or some other parts of the country or even the world to get them reconnected uh, with the amazing current students that we have and more recent alumni uh, that we have uh, in the region. So uh, thank you all for your continued uh, partnership and for the amazing work uh, that you do. There are a lot of different narratives about the Inland Empire some of them are not as flattering. Um, and, it's, and it's through our work and the recognition and the support that we give to each other uh, that we not only change the narrative, but really get people to understand the Inland Empire as it is with the tremendous assets uh, that we have. So just a lot of gratitude. Uh, we'll be hearing from some reactors or, or allies in LA County. Uh, just, just so grateful uh, for folks like Stephen Chung and Calvin Salt and others. Um, who see the importance of the interdependence uh, between LA County, Orange County, and the two counties of the Inland Empire. So thank you again, and I'll turn it over to Sarah, who'll say a bit more about the Innovation Homecoming. Thank you, Karthik. Um, and yes, I'm one of the new community engagement specialists here, and it's been quite a pleasure to join this amazing team. And I'm going to be talking about the Innovation Homecoming that we are having next week, a week from today, Wednesday, April 27th, from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, and as Karthik mentioned, it's, it's our effort to highlight and uplift some of the amazing homegrown innovators that we have. Um, coming out of here in the Inland Empire. So we're going to be highlighting folks that have been nominated um, for their remarkable innovations and because they've done some part of their schooling here in the IE. So they've either um, done their K through 12 here or they've gone um, to college, done some higher ed here. Um, and it's going to be changing the narrative um, that Karthik is um, 
that he touched on that um, we're going to be uplifting these folks um, and just highlighting the incredible people that are coming from our region. They may not um, be living here. They may be doing things in other parts of the country, the world. But um, regardless, we want to highlight um, all of their amazing, all of their amazing um, innovations um, to um, uplift our region. And I believe, yes, Gary um, dropped the link for the event in um, the chat. So please sign up, please come, um, please help us uplift um, all of these amazing folks that we're gonna be highlighting. Um, and I think with that, I'll go ahead now and turn it over to Gary to get us started um, with the rest of the program. Excellent, thank you so much, Sarah. So um, as I mentioned earlier, so now that it has been um, a year, oh, Eric, uh, could you start? Uh, there's a couple slides. Um, you have to go back a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Okay, thanks. Um, so yes, it's been a year since our uh, initial report that we put out and a lot has changed just in terms of where the world is at. And um, we just wanted to highlight some of the different things going on in terms of innovation in the region, share some of the updated data that we've been exploring. So uh, with that, I'll actually turn it over to our partner, Stacy Cumberbatch from Blended Impact to start us off with some updates. Stacy. Thanks so much, Gary. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all and thank you all for making the time. Really excited to be here. Um, Stacy Cumberbatch with Blended Impact. We're an innovation lab that focuses on public-private partnerships to advance capital access, uh, specifically in economic development and venture capital. Um, have been thrilled to work across LA and Riverside with a number of the cities and all of these organizations that are on the, uh, on the call. So excited to see everyone here and really thankful for uh, the folks from LA that have uh, joined us today. So thank you, Stephen. Uh, Thank you, Calvin, for making time because it's exciting to see the region really coalesce around um, what does the Southern California innovation ecosystem look like and to have uh, the support on this call is, is wonderful. Um, uh, as Gary mentioned a year ago, we started this report. So uh, I'll tell you a bit of the, the research process. Uh, Gary has been uh, amazing in terms of reaching out to folks and really uh, doing both qualitative and you know quantitative analysis. Um, the portion of the research that I kind of led on was private sector data. So we're looking at, for example, crunch based data, uh, King's crowd data, um, and in addition, really scrubbing the um, information that was submitted through all of our ecosystem partners. This is meant to start telling a story in terms of not only the inputs, but the outputs that are coming into the, to the region. Inputs meaning, what are we doing to encourage the innovation ecosystem, right? What is the work that's happening at the ecosystem level? And then outputs being what's happening at the company level and all of their successes. We wanna highlight both. We wanna highlight what's happening in the region so that we can have that comprehensive story, that same story that an LA can tell, a San Diego can tell, and we can really start lifting each other the Southern California um, region for innovation. So with that, um, if we'll go to the next slide, I'll kind of just remind folks of where we left off last year. So last year, we identified six key regions or, or key industries that are emerging as sectors in the ecosystem. Um, we're looking at ag tech, for example, biotech, clean tech, healthcare, and IT cybersecurity that are anchoring our region as emerging ecosystem players, um, in addition to social impact, creative arts, and, and placemaking that kind of underscores all of this. Um, this was discovered through um, uh, questions, uh, uh, in a, you know, in-depth research that that the the, the UCR Center for, for Social Innovation did, and you can see that report on the website last year, but just showing the anchor institutions that's leading those charges in terms of where they have their resources and where they're uh, bringing in additional dollars will start to tell a picture of where our innovation will grow into in the future. So really just wanted to remind folks of where our resources coming in now and where will they, you know, expect it to be growing from what we identified last year. Um, what happened in 2021 is that we unearthed it or discovered um, or, or had more in, um, uh, uh, eyes on us in terms of our rare earth mineral mining and our lithium extraction that's happening in the eastern parts of our county. So for example, in Mountain Pass in San Bernardino, there was rare you know, um, earth mines are, are discovered and the state has taken notice and they put millions of dollars to support the anchor company Mountain Pass materials there in the extraction and refinement of those minerals. Uh, in the Salton Sea, in the eastern side of the Coachella uh, Valley and in Imperial County, um, there was lithium discovered there that is now being uh, extracted 
responsibly and it will have to be re uh, refined. Um, there are three companies on ground there and that lithium is being looked at as a potential source of, uh, of rare minerals for the EV battery you know, production that will, it will take to produce all of our electric vehicles and meet those goals that the state has set. And not only nationally, this was part of a national um, call to action by President Biden as a uh, all eyes are on us essentially at the moment for this, this, this Lithium Valley um, uh, uh, find. So these are two new areas that are emerging in addition to what we had originally intended on, on, on focusing on. And I want to run into call those those things into play as you start seeing where we are um where we're going if we'll go to the next slide please so when we're considering where, where we're you know coming from and uh where we're intending to go we want to highlight some of the inputs that happened last year uh next slide please First, we want to recognize the state because they've supported us very, very heavily um, as a region. Uh, we have a number of you know, uh, local representation from the state, uh, and we're seeing that start to pay off in terms of the, the, the funding that's coming down. Uh, for example, in the Cal Competes Tax Credit Awards, uh, our companies directly received over $169 million. Um, this is not to our ecosystem, but to our companies. So that's a huge boon to keep them here and to grow them. And that's specifically what that, uh, that Cal Competes tax credit was for. Um, being that clean tech is one of our priorities as a, as a geography, really wanted to also highlight that uh, there, there are a number of state projects that are being awarded uh, clean tech funding uh, to the tune of about $4 million from the state as well. So really just wanted to thank the state for, for that input and we'll start to see that pay off as those projects are developed. Uh, next slide, please. Separate to that, when we're starting to look at the places that are receiving the development and where we're, we're going to be expecting talent and or um, innovation to come from, we start to see what um, what happened last year in terms of what was open. Uh, first, we had Ampac open their Entrepreneurship Center in Ontario. Uh, they also have their lending arm. So that's going to be um, a, a nice combination of both incubation and uh, financing that's in Ontario. We had a generous donation from uh, uh, Randall Lewis, who opened the Randall Lewis Center for Intra uh, Entrepreneurship innovation. And that was opened at the University of Luverne. So they'll be incubating uh, entrepreneurs there at that center. And we'll start to see some innovation coming out of, um, of that center at the Ontario location. Separately, uh, CVEP uh, out in the Coachella Valley opened, I believe it's now their third iHub in Palm Desert. So really giving credit to the work that they're doing out there. Um, and they'll be incubating um, uh, innovation companies out in the Palm Desert Hub, in addition to the one that they already have in Palm Springs. Um, and then certainly not last, uh, Loma Linda Uni uh, Hospital uh, was opened as an extension of Loma Linda University, and they'll be incubating new medical, um, uh, new medical technologies and services out of their hospital. So these are places that are open and, and major economic development projects that will start to incubate innovation around our core areas. And I really wanted to make sure that folks um, saw that because that's where we should be looking as well. Uh, next, please. And when we talk about inputs again, it's also what you know, folks are doing on the ground here locally, who's doing the work. And this is not by any means all inclusive, but uh, just to call out some things from what was submitted to us in our call for information, um, uh, who are supporting our entrepreneurs on the ground so that folks know where, where things are happening. For example, this is, event is part of Riverside County's Innovation Month here in uh, April. San Bernardino has their own small business month in November. Um, these are things that kind of coalesce around the innovation ecosystem. Uh, UC and San Bernardino, Cal State San Bernardino, both issued uh, entrepreneurship reports last year. This one being the second, um, but we, you know, we started last year in 2021, and uh, Cal State San Bernardino also issued their State of the Entrepreneur report last year. So those two things really start to put, you know, information out to the wider ecosystem that shows what the story is of innovation in this region. Um, IEGO leading as a coalition of of grant making and and, and grant seeking for our entrepreneurship initiatives, um, they led a very strong Build Back Better application, for example, and consortia to to try to seek funding for the the programs that we have here. Uh, the city of Riverside, they launched their Angel Summit last year in participation with UCR. They were able to award about $100,000 to, I believe it was either two or three startups, but that was a first for them. And that was huge to even have that level of engagement and support for our, our fund, you know, our founders directly. 
Uh, the city of Ontario launched their idea exchange on a monthly basis. They're now coalescing around ideas and innovation you know, uh, talks, and this is sponsored by the city. So even seeing the city bring that level of, of engagement is great to see. Uh, the Caravans are our project on, are on the call with us. Uh, they not only continued their Seed Lab Fellowship, but they uh, were able to launch a California Dream Fund, uh, which they received from a grant from the state of California and are now um, executing and awarding on that. So that's great to see that our entrepreneurs now have that access to capital where it was not available before. Um, and our company, London Impact, we launched Opportunity Coachella in the Coachella Valley last year. It was the city of Coachella's first ever entrepreneurship initiative. Um, we awarded funding to uh, six companies and we have one major economic development project that we've still been working on alongside the city uh, that received national press and, and we're uh, thankful to be a part of that initiative to even help the, the city of Coachella, you know, stand that effort up. And again, uh, starting this, this report last year. One IE, also on the line, have been very active with their Lean Canvas Bootcamp weekends. They launched a Women in Tech meetup um, first, you know, for the region. So it's great to see that we have those initiatives also, you know, being stood up on a monthly basis. And then there's standing things that local entrepreneurs are doing, like our Techno Tuesdays um, that is held at Kevin's Space, for example, at Fourth Sector that we have, you know, active in Ontario as well. So even having those kind of place-based activities that entrepreneurs can go to to launch their, um, their companies and plug into networks is great for our region. Um, and I wouldn't want to leave out any of our chambers of commerces or SBDCs or you know, technical assistance providers for the work they do on a day-to-day -day basis with entrepreneurs one-on-one. -on -one. So really just wanted to highlight that as some of the ways that entrepreneurs can plug in and ways that we're trying to grow the ecosystem here as a, you know, as a region as a whole. So with that, can we go to the next slide, please? So what does that all result in? What do we get out of all this work? And this is by all means not inclusive. This is actually meant to be a teaser. You'll see that we have not released the, the report yet. This is a teaser to what will be in the full report. Um, we, again, we analyzed uh, Crunchbase, King's Crowd, um, and all of the data that was submitted to us. And we, we wanted numbers, numbers that can translate into what others are reporting to, to start tying our stories together. So um, on Crunchbase, it was reported that private companies in the Inland Empire raised a total of $171 million in 2021. That is obviously not inclusive. We have multiple incubators and accelerators at the University of California, for example, UCR. Um, they've raised multiple millions in and of themselves. This is outside of the university and expanded, and this is only to companies that report to Crunchbase. So it's good to see that we're, we're seeing these numbers and being able to track that year over year will really just start to tell the story of, of how our companies are doing in, in, as an ecosystem. Um, what was interesting was crowdfunding data was provided to us privately by uh, King's Crowd that tracks multiple crowdfunding uh, websites, and we're seeing that uh, crowdfunding is emerging as a key way for seed entrepreneurs to raise, fund, raise funding in diverse geographies, and, and, and this is specifically because close to about $4 million was raised uh, via startups um, on their platforms. And they were raised in areas that are outside of our university systems. For example, it was raised in Upland, in Norco, in Palm Desert, in Yucca Valley. These are places where there may not be, you know, the, the existing entrepreneurship ecosystem that we thought, but they were able to find the resources that they needed because we've already been, you know, showing that there were crowdfunding availabilities and we promote that and they've been taking advantage of that. So I really wanted to call attention to that. Um, we had our highest fundraising round as a Series B last year. Uh, Plant Prefab raised $38 million and they're based in Rialto in um, Ontario. Uh, they're a construction, a tech construction company. Uh, and we're really excited to see that. We had not seen a Series B in several years. So even having them located in this area um, and, and raising that uh, level of funding is significant. And the reason it's significant is because data has shown that tech funded companies higher at eight times the rate than non-tech funded companies, right? So if we can see that we have these numbers of fundings, uh, that means it only translates into job growth, right? And the high paying jobs that we want to see. So that's why I'm calling attention to these funding rounds because it translates immediately into jobs. Um, notably, Adatex Therapeutics raised um, First, I'll, I'll tell you their story. They were founded in 2017. So this is about four to five years old right now. This is a biotech company with Loma Linda alumni. Founded in 2017, they had an IPO in 2020 and they raised $11 million at their RPO. In 2021, they raised an additional $11 million. So when we start to say, hey, our emerging industries are biotech, agrotech, clean tech, et cetera, this is one of the companies that can show what can happen in a four year period of time. Right. So 
in that you know 2017 to 2021 period, they've now raised $22 million um, even after uh, IPOing, et cetera. And that is a Loma Linda alum that leads that company. We also had an IPO last year, $63 million on NASDAQ. And we had about 30 companies that were, um, were raising and or acquired via private equity funds. So there is that diversity of capital as well in the region. Uh, a notable one that I just noticed was Crocs, for example, bought one of our companies for $2.5 billion. So this and more will be in the report. So please stay tuned as we release that within the next week or so. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, I'll just give you one more highlight. All of this translates to the city level as well. This all starts to be recognized nationally when we have these kind of outputs, because we're starting to see our cities uh, recognized on national reports. For example, the city of Riverside recognized as a top 25 future focused city. We have um, the Inland Empire as a region was highlighted for top cities for job seekers. Um, and we have three cities on the list as top cities for uh, income growth for black women. So that is you know, great to see that we're, we're experiencing that. And um, with that, I will leave you with the teaser to please stay tuned and I'll turn it over to Gary to complete the rest of the findings in the report. Excellent, thank you so much, Stacy. Uh, you can go to the next slide, excellent. Um, so a really important part of the innovation ecosystem is this connection between education and the workforce. Um, in our previous report, we talked a lot about the local landscape of jobs and education. Um, so since then, we've been able to add another year of data to some of those indicators that we originally looked at. So we'd like to share some of that with you today. Um, next slide, please. So first, um, you know, our region has incredible universities and colleges. Uh, many have great centers and with specific specialties. Um, there's a lot of talent out there. And this graph shows the number of both BA and master's degrees being awarded in the IE um, going back to 2014. And you can see a general increase in both over time. Um, with the addition of the 2020 data, we see that BA degrees saw a significant increase from 2019 to 2020. Uh, that's the blue line at the top there in the very uh, right-hand corner. Um, and this is the largest increase in degrees across all years since 2014. Next slide, please. So when we took that data and disaggregated it by gender and race, um, so this is specifically uh, STEM degrees, both BA and master's degrees for 2019 and 2020. Um, essentially, we find that you know, gender and racial gaps still persist uh, in the more recent data. Uh, so, for example, while the Hispanic and Latino share of BA and master's degrees have increased, their share of STEM master's degrees in 2020 is still just about 17 percent. Um, similarly, the, the share of Black students graduating with a BA and master's degrees has also increased in the past year, but it still remains very low at 4 percent for a BA and 3% and for masters. Um, when we look kind of in terms of gender, we do see some movement towards equity in, in BA STEM degrees, uh, but the gap for master's degrees has widened in the past year for women who make up about 32%. So kind of overall, the data highlight the importance of continuing to reach out, engage and invest in historically marginalized populations in these STEM fields. And there is most certainly work being done in that space in, in our region for sure, um, but it's gonna take more investment and likely more time to see those numbers kind of move. Next slide, please. So last year, we also looked at innovation-related job postings through the Burning Glass data set. So Burning Glass is a large data set that tracks job postings by year and region. Um, since Burning Glass started keeping track in 2016, all innovation-related job postings have increased for each region. So for reference, the IEs highlighted here in yellow um, by, by county. Um, but we found when comparing regions that the IE and specifically San Bernardino County experienced an incredible percentage increase since 2016, um, the highest for all the regions that we looked at. And with this additional year of data, the Inland Empire really continues to be a very active region in terms of job postings uh, compared to other subregions in California and at the state level. Uh, on the next slide, 
we can see, so this is kind of like a better way to visualize this percentage change. You can see San Bernardino County had 128% increase in postings since 2016. Uh, Riverside's at 111% compared to 70 at the state level, 56% in LA County, and then in even San Diego, um, which has a lot of tech, a lot of STEM in their region, didn't see an increase like the IE. So I think it kind of speaks uh, a little bit to our region's ability and potential to grow. Um, other older or more established ecosystems might not have the elasticity and ability to expand as much as we do. So there's a lot of potential out there. Um, so, and Stacy had mentioned, we're gonna be producing some uh, shareable materials with a lot of this information, not a full length report like last year, um, but just some of the updates that we've talked about here. Also, um, if there's an important update that we missed or doesn't seem to be in our radar, please reach out to us. I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, uh, we're going to be adding a lot to our iSquare.org website as well, including a, um, a new Founders Corner blog, which will be about different founders and CEOs in the region, blogging, telling their stories, and trying to connect everything back to the Inland Empire. So if you're a founder and you're interested, please reach out to me as well. Um, so I'll pause there for a moment and um, to see if anyone has any questions before we move into the showcases section. Okay. Well, well b oh, before, it, let me just add one thing folks and I, I'll, I'll look for the link if, uh, or maybe someone can find it. In addition to my role at the Center for Social Innovation, you may um, know, but my role at California 100, this is a transformative statewide initiative and advanced technology is one of the kind of core areas in that work. Uh, my, the, so I, I'm the executive director of that. We have directors of research, advanced technology and the like. We had the privilege today to present to the Tech Caucus and the State Assembly. Uh, and, and we had a survey that we had uh, administered um, with um, innovators, especially in the kind of R&D space and in industry. One of, the, one of the themes that emerged was the need to invest more in the Central Valley and Inland Empire. Uh, that solves a whole bunch of problems for the state, including crowding investments in places where land, you know, land is scarce, both for housing development and um, uh, economic development. Um, Allison and I, Allison Burke, who is our director of advanced technology, she's based out of Stanford. She and I had an op-ed in the Southern California News Group uh, papers, uh, and you can find it online at OC Register, PE, LA Daily News, et cetera. Uh, and the title was Let a Thousand Silicon Valleys Bloom. And essentially to say that we have innovation, not just potential, but actual innovation and investments happening in so many different parts of the state. Uh, and we give shout outs to uh, the Inland Empire. Uh, and some of the assets here. So take a look and hopefully, I mean, we're hoping that decision makers in Sacramento will, will take notice. There already are some investments that are part of the governor's budget that, hopefully, that you know, that are mentioned in our report and, and other reports. So hopefully, um, you know, there, there's more to come in terms of uh, public support for uh, for the kind of innovations that are happening here. So I just wanted to mention that, Gary. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Karthik. And I saw, um... Ellie in the chat asked about, um, you know, what we consider innovation jobs. Um, in our report last year, we go into detail and, and kind of talk about, um, it, it's kind of under the uh, like Bureau and Labor Statistics, Statistics classifications. So we kind of have a list, um, but I will, uh, I will, I'll, I can share it with you, especially if you, if you drop your email in the, in the chat, Ellie, I can, Kind of give you a direct thing because it's it's quite a long list so I don't I don't know it off the top of my head but we do have um, a way that we kind of came to that decision so um, so with that uh, I'd like to move into the showcase section where we highlight some of these great organizations and innovators that we've been talking about so first up uh, we have Miha and Griselia from the Canvasari project very excited to hear from them. So you can take it all away as soon as you're ready with the share screen. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us today. And uh, 
we are thrilled to be part of this uh, this network and we attended also the other meeting so uh, when we uh, received the invitation for Car from Cartrick we were uh, we thought you know it'd be a good opportunity not only to talk about our future plans but also to reflect a bit about how uh, we arrived where where we are so um, my name is Mihai Patru and I'm the executive director of Caravans Right Project, but also one of the founders of the organization uh, that was established in, uh, in 2016. One of the questions that we have been receiving repeatedly is what Caravans Right means. I know it's a tongue twister, it's not easy to pronounce, but I think that has become part of our brand to some extent. So. Um, caravan Sarai, everyone knows what a caravan is, uh, and I think the problem is the Sarai part. It's a word of Persian origin, and it used to mean an inn uh, along uh, major trade routes that in time became a hub for exchange of goods, information, and eventually uh, different connect providing a platform for different cultures to, to connect. So that is a, what the caravanserai is. And when we thought about using this, this word, we wanted to, have, to create an organization that was a platform for mission-driven entrepreneurs, change makers that will work with us along their journeys and then a, for us to provide support to whatever projects they were involved with, involved in, and then they were able to to continue and grow, literally continue along their journeys. Caravanserais are still popular. M many of them, especially in the Middle East, have become very fancy hotels, but still, as an institution, still exists, especially in that region. Um, so just a bit about us, we are a 501c3 and we define ourselves as a hybrid mission-driven uh, venture that aims to support mission-driven leaders along their journey. Journeys that I mentioned, we established the organization in 2016 in Washington, D.C., but we have been uh, working almost exclusively in the Inland Empire and California in general since 2018. In terms of the team, uh, it's a team of four. Our board is very involved. All of us are Inland Empire based. And I think I was, when I was preparing this uh, presentation last night, very late, I, I thought about some <clears throat> interesting facts about our team. Uh, we can engage in three different, in four different languages. All four are each of us has a different mother tongue. There are three national, uh, different nationalities within our team. So that makes it uh, very interesting and engaging in the same time. In terms of our beneficiaries, we serve mission-driven leaders and ventures. And by that, we understand both for-profit and non-profit organizations. Our main focus so far uh, has been on the Inland Empire in particular and California in general but also we are involved in a number of national and international projects. More recently, uh, we have been working with a group of partners in, uh, in the Czech Republic uh, to, to support um, LGBTQ uh, refugees from, uh, from Ukraine. Um, just as uh, the next thing that I wanna talk about is really how uh, Caravanserai project started and what is at the core of, of our work. And we I, a, a couple of years ago, uh, we spent some time with our board and some of our partners in the region and not only thinking about what we have identified as challenges and opportunities in the region, but not only. And in terms of challenges, uh, what we have noticed, and these are things that um, we have uh, try not to solve, but maybe provide some uh, solutions, inadequate force training in the region, where especially when it comes to the mission-driven sector, uh, limited professional development opportunities, but also a community that is very fragmented, 
also due because of the vast and varied geography that we are we are part of. More importantly, there are the opportunities that we have noticed and kind of provided jet fuel through our work and all the initiatives that we have uh, created, but also uh, we are planning to, to launch soon. Uh, um, openness to innovation and entrepreneurship. We've been working with individuals that have demonstrated extreme excellence and high degree of resilience in the region, energetic leaders, and a lot of untapped and unrecognized talent in the Inland Empire. Also the intellectual and the experiential capital uh, that we have been um, honored to, to support has been, has been quite impressive. Also, and uh, it's the creative uh, innovation scattered throughout the region, whether we are working with partners in San Bernardino or Coachella or Indio. Um, we identified four strategies that Caravanserai has been um, navigating and trying to um, use as four main uh, lanes uh, throughout our work. One is about moving the curve and we are thinking about in terms of um, supporting those that have been traditionally left behind, but also speed up and strengthen those who excel at their work. And when we were talking about this strategy, we really imagine a train that has two en engines, one that is uh, pulling the train and one another engine at the end that is pushing the train and the train being all these um, excellent mission driven organizations and entrepreneurs, whether they are exploring uh, implementing solutions or they are already uh, established uh, to some extent or have been around in the region for uh, for a number or for a number of years uh, the other third strategy that we thought it was very important and it's part of our approach to technical assistance and capacity building is really that at the core of sustainable and relevant mission driven organization it is the organization organizational strength and its capacity to uh, constantly innovate take risks think outside the box and also look in the future in the same time and that strategy has been translated within caravans right project as building stronger and future thinking organizations and we are talking about develop capacity provide access to resources focus on sustainability organizational impact and that at the end of the day will create these transformational organizations that are less transactional and are looking towards the future and how their impact will uh, will change the well-being of our communities. Uh, we are thinking of the current uh, period as uh, a lot of organizations struggling and the status quo is um, quite uh, covers a larger portion of our in uh, of our daily routine, but in the future through our work and the work of other organizations, some of them here in the room, we are thinking of uh, the transformative character of mission-driven organizations, and not only that will grow, also a lot of these early stage organizations or some of them who might be struggling to actually become thriving and increase the number of startups in the region. And we will talk a bit about our approach when it comes to startups, uh in a few minutes the final strategy and obviously these four strategies are not uh, it's our approach so i'm sure we are missing a lot of aspects but we are we've been constantly learning from our partners and the beneficiaries that we have been working with is really a weave a stronger and bolder fra fabric within our community and that strategy is really seen as through our work as building powerful groups, developing connections, and increase the trust, the trust and common vision that various stakeholders in the region and not only are uh, are part of. And so far, uh, we've seen we've been struggling, and I'm sure that has been an experience that all of us here has uh, has been part of is the limited coordination, limited power and impact uh, that our organizations and our work has, especially that in many 
situations, all of us are working in silos. So by building powerful groups, developing strong connections and increasing the trust in each other, these small groups will work together, will develop partnerships and collaborations and um, that will, uh, will, lead us, will lead the future. And just from our experience, we have developed over the last few years really strong partnerships with the Community Foundation, the Center for Social Innovation, the Inland Empire Community Collaborative in different contexts and uh, working on different projects together. We just recently started a very exciting partnership with Camp Riverside County. So that has been developing uh, our own network of partners on different for different projects and initiatives has really uh, energized many of our of our uh, projects. We are only going to talk about give example of some of the initiatives that we have launched uh, in the past or currently working on, and I will invite my colleague Graciela to to take over this part. Graciela. Thank you so much, Mihai, and thank you everyone for coming on today. We really do appreciate it. We'll go through it really quickly because I know we're short on time, but my name is Graciela Moran and I serve as the External Affairs Officer for Caravan Story Project. I'm a recent graduate from Cal State San Bernardino and I'm working towards my MPA at San Diego State and I'm going into my second year. So we're almost there, but I want to talk a little bit about Seed Lab and Mihai went over the strategies on how um, we implement everything. And these are kind of the, the how we move forward with it. And so in partnership with UCR Extension, um, it's an um, it's a seed lab pre accelerator. It's an eight month um, program for early stage social entrepreneurs um, from historically marginalized and underserved communities. And so it's up to twelve fellows, and they do have access to technical assistance. Some facts about it are ninety five percent of our seed lab fellows are women or underrepresented marginalized groups. A hundred percent of our seed lab fellows come from diverse backgrounds, which traditionally, as we know, are not represented in the entrepreneurship sector. Um, as we talked about previously, and many of our seed lab graduates leave with um, external funding investment opportunities, such as a dream fund, which I'll talk a little bit about our next application cycle. If you know anyone who's interested, you may be interested to take your venture to the next level um, it will be the 2022 23 cohort, which will open on the 25th of April and then um, um, will begin in October 2022 and May, um, end May 2023. We're currently um, preparing for our graduation and we'll be in touch. Um, next slide, please. And so our next, um, the way that we do that is our strategic networking and planning circles. So we design it following the kitchen cabinet, cabinet model and which we do um, and it's to create safe, trusted, supporting environment where leaders can come into a room and they can share ideas, consult with peers and feel safe and make sure that they also move together and make change together. So we have up to 10 organizational leaders um, and they're two to three hour meetings and they're from various sectors and they have conversations based on financial planning, fundraising, donor engagement, and how to implement these strategies. Um, so we have two, um, two circles. One is a CEO circle as well as the DEI circle. Um, a little fact about the DEI circle, we bring in experts. We don't do the, this ourselves um, because we do understand that there's talent everywhere and we want to make sure that we uplift other folks. Um, so two of our experts are Taharima Habib and Rajiv Desai, where they help us out um, and um, give these courses as well. Um, next slide. And then um, another one that we do is a breakthrough master classes. They're, they're customized trainings, which we provide to experienced CEOs or advanced organizational leaderships. The four tracks that we do do are organizational survival and sustainability, organizational impact, future leadership, as well as organizational transformation. And then a little bit of what Mihai was talking a little about, uh, about was the nonprofit workforce development professional certificate program. I know it's a, it's a mouthful, but it's really it's one of the, the things that will push our um, our work to the next level. It's a program um, passed already by the, um, the UCR extension through the Senate, and it's a nine to 12 month workforce training program uh, over 140 hours. And so they'll enroll it either in the fall 2022 or winter 2023, we've partnered up with the Inland Empire Community Collaborative and um, they help us out. They're gonna help us out with that. They support nonprofits to collectively advocate and making the region more equitable, diverse and through capacity building strategies and collaboration. And so a lot of the folks who will be applying to this program will be young graduates, 
early career professionals in the nonprofit sector, individuals in the professional reconversion path. As we know, um, going into a nonprofit, being a recent graduate, it's very difficult to find a job and being taken seriously. And this certificate program will help out those folks um, wanting that, that extra push and experience. Next slide, please. And then I kind of, we just kind of want to talk a little bit about investing in mission-driven entrepreneurs and ventures, a little bit on how, how we're, we're doing this, who's helping us out, and how we've taken that next step to, to have everything funded. So one of the, the grants that we did receive um, last year was the Wells Fargo Open for Business Fund. We received $1 million worth of technical assistance and capacity building programs for the Inland Empire, which is a which is very rare to see. We did this in terms of um, partnerships. We really, truly believe that if we partner together, um, then we'll we'll be able to see the the best um, the best um, outcomes. So we partnered together with Inland Empire Community Foundation, and they'll be using their funds to do the the hub that they just recently announced, as well as IECC um, to help out with their capacity building trainings. And so with this fund, we kind of framed it in a terms of you know we are small businesses too. We also have payroll as well. Nonprofits and for-profits should be treated this, the same as small, prof, um, small businesses. So that's the, the way that we went about that one. And it's been extremely valuable and it's helped us expand our team from how Mihai said one team member all the way to four team members, um, which has been extremely um, a blessing. And another way that was um, briefly mentioned was the Dream Fund which is $500,000 in micro grants for Inland Empire based mission startups, um, which will begin, we started in March and will close in this, um, December, 2022. Um, and so this one is a very exciting one because um, they're early stage entrepreneurs. This one's in partnership with um, um, California Office of Small Business Advocates. And there, we are a part of the 17 centers in California that are providing this technical assistance, which is, um, an innovative way to, to help all our, our, our entrepreneurs here in the Inland Empire. And we are making sure that we hit in the Inland Empire the most that we can with this money. Um, and then we also too have, we um, are having 1.5 million in micro grants for Inland Empire startups as well. That's in July, 2022 and February, 2024. We'll come out with uh, more information once we're, we're given the okay to, to announce that, but that one is going to be a very exciting one. And please keep your eye on that. and. Um, stay in touch with us and um, we're happy to, you know, definitely share this information and um, have you a part of our network. And I think that's uh, it. Right? Thank you, Graciela. Yes. No, that has been uh, our 15 minute presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you, Graciela. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. That was great. Um, I also do want to mention that uh, we'll make all the slide presentations available on our IE Squared website as like PDF. So everyone can go back and kind of review the details because I mean, there's so much packed into these. Um, it's it's hard to, to see everything. So um, so we can just move into a time with just a couple, uh, if we have any questions from the audience or from the chat, um, anyone want to ask uh, Caravan Sarai. Okay, Calvin, I see you've got a hand up. Go ahead. So, well, thanks, Graciela and Mihai, for your presentation. I think the work you're doing is absolutely incredible. I will be tracking that 1.5 million in micro grants, and I just think it, it you know, you're going to see, as, as you've probably already seen with your impact, just the power of trusting these organizations with these micro grants to let them level up and do their work. So, it's so exciting to see that happening in the IE. I'm biased because we have a similar program in Pledge LA focused on um, entrepreneurs of color. But yeah, my question for you is really about the nonprofit for profit sort of straddling of these social enterprises. Um, I've seen organizations sort of sometimes have to change their status as they pursue sustainability, trying to find you know, startup funding, nonprofit, foundation funding. Can you just tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing in the Inland Empire? Are you seeing some of the orgs you serve figure out, oh, now we have to become a startup. Now we have to become a nonprofit. And you know, you know, the, the hard part of all that technical assistance is really ensuring that financial sustainability with foundations and donors and others. So just a little bit, any more light you can shed on that. I'd love to hear. Yeah. Sure. Th thank you, Calvin. Uh, about the, the micro grant thing program, uh, we are mainly focusing on the Inland Empire because this is a region that traditionally has been ignored when it comes to uh, micro grants, especially startups. So, uh, you know, if you have uh, beneficiaries that might take advantage of this program, please send us our way, you know, getting to grants for 
will not hurt anyone. <laughs> uh, so that's a, going back to your question. I, I think our approach as an organization to mission driven work and social impact has been uh, maybe more fluid in the sense that we really are whether they are for profit, especially for profit organizations, we are working with them to figure out how they can use their work if they never thought about the social impact that they might have, uh, what exactly, how they can rethink their work in order to generate, uh, to have uh, the positive impact on the communities they are part of or on the beneficiaries that the, their customers and the beneficiaries that they, they are serving. And we understand it's an um, ongoing process and um, during their journeys, they might change from a for-profit model to a non-profit model and so on. But that's something we encourage in a way because we better see, we prefer to see organizations that are thriving than organizations that are struggling and are the victims of their incorporation status. If your model, if your business model doesn't work, you better change it because you will not advance whether as an entrepreneur, an organization, or as a business. And we really think that uh, for-profit and non-profit are basically uh, business models that organizations adopt. So if one doesn't work, we encourage you to change it and look at other opportunities. And we had, especially as part of Seed Lab, where we work with organizations for over a period of eight months, we had startups that came into the program as a nonprofit or as a for-profit and just really uh, working with them better understanding their business model, their customer discovery, their customers, their competition. And I think we have one of our collaborator, uh, collaborators here, Carolina Rosas, that is our expert on customer discovery and, oh, hi, Carol, uh, and uh, uh, competition, working with them to understand what works best. And there have been numerous cases where they decided the for-profit model does not work for what I want to do. So I will incorporate as a nonprofit and the other way around. Unfortunately, a lot of startups or a lot of entrepreneurs adopt a nonprofit model without actually knowing what a nonprofit is and what are the um, uh, requirements and the obligations as a nonprofit organization. And when they realize that they have second thoughts about that, adopting that particular business model. And I, I did that answer the question? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, I see your hand is up. Yes, thank you so much. Graziella and Mihai, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, really inspired by uh, specifically the strategies uh, that you listed. I want to specifically ask about strategy number one, where um, you're really focusing on including those who have been traditionally left behind, which is a, a, an enormous mission that I think a lot of us have been trying to do in the region. Uh, over uh, the period of COVID, we start realizing we understood the those that have traditionally been left behind, the um, the income divide and sometimes access to services is so wide that we realize even when we're reaching out to those who are left behind, there's still a section that even more left behind. For example, uh, as we're reaching out to folks, sometimes we use uh, email campaigns and online campaigns, but because of the digital divide, a lot of folks even, don't even have access. So I was hoping that you can uh, share a bit more in terms of your approach. How do you make sure that you target the most vulnerable communities and what have been successful in terms of reaching those population uh, that really need the most support and help? Thank you. Sure. Th thank you, Stephen. And I will um, invite Graciela to jump in because she is uh, leading this effort, especially over the last, uh, since August last year, when she joined our team of, of, you know, her strategy of reaching out to different communities. But I, I think that really takes me back to a conversation that Kartik and us had in 2017, maybe, and we were talking about Seed Lab Pre Accelerator uh, started in partnership with the Center for Social Innovation and Cartrix input and support, and everyone at, at UCR. Uh, the main reason of designing that program was really to target um, 
this community, you know, entrepreneurs that might never think about, uh, although they they have been active in their communities and um, achieving social impact, they never thought of themselves as an entrepreneur and what does it take to be, you know, to grow that particular initiative and turn it into a sustainable business. And by business, I also include nonprofit uh, organizations there. So when we were discussing early 20, late 2017, early 2018 with Kardik about designing the program, that has, was our focus and it still is. We are uh, very particular about inviting people that are recommended uh, by our par- network of partners that have been doing amazing work in communities and they need, in order to take it to the next level, they need support with their infrastructure, business, business planning, and so on. The other thing is um, we have not only because of the region we are part of and uh, but also i think we have been um quite successful at reaching out to these pockets of excellence within underserved communities uh marginalized communities but also in general groups that have limited access to resources. Just learning about the Dream Fund, for example, which literally it's free money. Startups, there are so limited requirements. Graciela has spent weeks of designing and with our team, Bradley as well, uh, really thinking how do we, what partnerships we need to get to Native Americans, for example, that we've learned it's uh, it's a challenge to get in contact with those groups in particular or communities in Coachella or Indio. And Graciela, maybe you want to talk a bit about uh, what we've seen um, as part of Dream Fund and the selection process and the uh, uh, work that we've done to reach these communities in particular. Oh yeah, thank you again, Stephen, for that for that question, and thank you, Mihai. I think one of the the well, my role is external affairs, and I think one of the the ways that Mihai and Stephen have done it is one of the ways is hiring us. You will rarely see someone that looks like me from my demographics in this role because most people who do get hired in this role, you have ten plus years of experience, or they have the connection, or whatever it is. And so I really am thankful for me, hi, and Steven, for, for taking that chance on me and letting me learn and grow. But because of that, we've been able to tap into communities that we did, in all honesty, when we started the Dream Fund program, it was um, it was a risk in terms of who are we gonna reach? What's, what is what is it gonna look like? And our outcomes have been extremely, more than we could have dreamed of in, in a sense, because we did reach out to local assembly members, senators, we had that, we, we touched, I find it more important to, have the connection with the field reps, become connected with the staff members because those, those key staff members know the people, they're on the field. So um, doing that is, is extremely important. It's been one of the key things that we have um, seen. A lot of the things with our applications, we did notice that there's a, a literacy problem. There's a writing problem. You know, there's a lot of folks who do have that, you know, when it comes to applications, it is an issue, you know, but we try our best to look past that. And we we look at the, the actual the, the innovative idea. And if it if it sparked, it's, it's like, this is great. You know, we kind of look past that and we make sure that we get in touch with them and talk to them. I think that's the problem, I think, with a lot of grants and making sure that um, is is looking over that. So when we look through the Dream Fund um, applications, we, we tried our, our very best to, to make sure that we looked at those innovative ideas and looking past, you know, the 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 other requirements in terms of literacy, et cetera. And you'll see in, in um in the next um grant and the next cycle that we do have, we'll we'll tap into those communities even more um in terms of the folks who how you were saying, you know, the digital divide, you know, we'll tap into street vendors, we'll tap into um fruit vendors, we'll tap into those folks who who are non-native um English speakers. Um and so it, it it's a it's a work in progress, but um, but we're working on it as well. But thank you, Stephen, for that, and I hope it answered it. Um, and we'll be we'll be sure to keep in touch with you and share everything. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Thank you again for that great presentation and follow up conversations. Um, we're talking about the importance of you know using that equity lens that we've been talking about. Um, so next, uh, I'd like to introduce Kevin from Fourth Sector Innovations to do uh, his presentation. 
Kevin. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Mihai and Graciela. That was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, we, we need to, to follow up. I think there's great synergy. I hate that overused word, but I really think there is. So I look forward to it. Uh, so I'm Kevin Meredith. I'm a founder at Fourth Sector Innovations. And really what I'm hoping to do today is just really break down an incredible amount of, of work and uh, effort into two words. And those two words are inspire and deliver. And so throughout this entire presentation, I'd, I'd really like to keep those words right on the tip of our tongue. Because if we have one without the other, um, we're sub-optimizing the resources that we have. Um, and I want us to really honor um, the ability that each of us on this call and all the individuals that we're trying to support through our efforts, um, they, they are the inspiration. They are the ones that are going to create this world that we're trying to be a part of um, and make it more accessible for people to see their dreams into reality, to see value brought forward. So, uh, oh, it did not advance the slide. We'll see. There we go. Uh, so the, the this is our take on Inspire. Uh, you know, here's the but uh, the idea here is that if we collectively are not inspiring people to take chances to pursue value from their own perspectives, then we're going to leave people behind. And a system that does not honor each individual and the collective abilities of those communities uh, is, is never gonna succeed. It's always gonna be uh, available for significant shocks to uh, its existence and not be able to deliver uh, ultimately. So I wanna just set the context of, of inspiration in my own story in a little bit. Um, in a way to help other people be inspired. So this is basically the arc of my career. I uh, got an engineering degree, industrial and systems engineering, uh, both bachelor's and master's from the Rochester Institute of Technology, and then jumped right in to work for the Boeing company. And I was working on rockets. I mean, amazing. Uh, to be where I'm from and be able to do that uh, is just kind of mind boggling. But then as we progress through my career, there's a lot of parallels to different aspects of innovation. And I, and I think this is something that has really shaped our approach to innovation and how we teach innovation is that, you know, all this demagoguery around disruption, disruption, disruption really is doing more of a disservice than benefit because almost all the innovation that happens in the world is down at the incremental side of the equation. These are a cumulative value that's created by small steps to create big impact. And when all we're trying to do is break a paradigm every single time, we're gonna swing for the grand slam and miss it more times than we're gonna hit it. And so we really wanna honor this idea of having a spectrum of innovation that will produce great value uh, in, in what people can achieve. And so my career actually follows this traje trajectory or across this spectra, uh, spectrum pretty, pretty uh, tightly, where initially I was doing process improvement, lean, the elimination of waste, Six Sigma, the elimination of variation. And then as I started to progress in my career, was exposed to bigger and bigger chunks of improvement that we were seeking to achieve or value that we were seeking to uh, attain. And so all the way towards the end, I was in Boeing's corporate venturing group. I was leading an enterprise initiative around innovation where we created 18 individual spaces around the globe that were connected. And these were spaces where employees could bring forward their ideas, their passions and their expertise and have a mechanism to get those things incorporated into the actual business. And these pathways did not exist in any other significant way, we thought. We then became aware of all these other activities that were happening around the, the, the globe and the company. 
And that's where this notion of having uh, an augmentation, a collective set of capabilities to augment the traditional pathways of innovation in an established company like Boeing, who literally helped put people on the moon. And so the idea that even a hundred year old company, hundred billion dollars a year in revenue still had vast uh, swim lanes to improve their ability to deliver on innovation and ultimately the value to their customers and the stakeholders that are counting on them. So that only is here not to like pound my chest and say, you know, look at Kevin's background. It's to give some sense of credibility to the insights that we've developed throughout the last 20 years around innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and I should mention on the entrepreneurship, I was in Boeing's corporate venturing group called Boeing Ventures for the last couple of years of my career at Boeing. Um, and that was looking at what are those next big opportunities in a company the size of Boeing that would be interesting to a company like the size of Boeing. And so uh, it was an amazing place to, to learn and, and see things from a totally different perspective than other traditional business lines in the company. Um, the reason I included this in the inspiration though, is if you look at where I'm from, I should not have ever worked for Boeing. I should not have had the opportunity to become an engineer. If, if we look at strictly the numbers, you know, this is me in the middle row or column, excuse me. Um, that's literally me at five years old driving a, a asphalt or stone and oil roller for my father's business. This is the service economy that I grew up in. Farms, service sector jobs. I am unusual in that most of the people in my region stayed in that region. They, even if they go to college, they come back to that region and the economic opportunities for them are limited. And it's because I had great inspiration, like my grandfather, who was an engineer at Northrop and Northrop Grumman, well, Grumman and Northrop Grumman, he was my inspiration to be an engineer and to be a good human being. And I think that is all of our responsibility to make sure that we are all giving people someone like my grandfather to be inspired by and to look up to and to be able to do more than what we think we are allowed or should be able to do. And that is at the absolute core of what we're trying to do at Fourth Sector Innovations. We wanna make the power of innovation and entrepreneurship accessible to anybody that wants to create meaningful value. And so there's a couple of ways in which we're doing that here locally because we want everyone to be inspired and feel the confidence that they really can change the world. You know, this is, there's a lot of naivety that goes into this kind of thinking. Um, when you peel back, oh, you know, but have you considered this or have you risked this part or all of that will come to matter. But if we don't have the ability to inspire people going into their quest, then it's gonna to be too easy to dismiss the amazing ideas and realize the great potential that we all want to achieve. Some of the ways that we're helping people do that in the region are primarily through the work we're doing in Ontario, but we are expanding, we just expanded out into Riverside and uh, we're looking to expand out into LA, primarily in Claremont and we're based in Orange County. So we have a good chunk of Southern California covered, but Ontario is kind of the flagship experience for us to be able to provide this inspiration to real individuals in the region. And uh, Fourth Sector Ontario is a collective, it's a physical space where anyone in the community can come and engage in innovation and entrepreneurship, and even more than engage, get access to world-class innovation and entrepreneurship capability 
with no fee or dilutive equity stake in their ventures, if they're even at the point where they have a venture. So we have a suite of opportunities available. We have co-working for like-minded individuals to have a, a common place to get together and work either individually or collectively in a low overhead way, in a very accessible way. And then we have two programs Interphase Incubator and Instantaneous Accelerator, which in Ontario are 100% focused on commerce and logistics tech. Because if we ignore, and, and I noticed that nothing about logistics was on the areas of focus for the future, but if we ignore all the big negatives and, extern and, and negative externalities associated with the biggest, one of the biggest economic drivers of the region, we're going to miss the boat on creating the solutions to those problems that can scale across the world and can create that 8x job return um, and growth number that Stacy was talking about up front. So we think that, you know, tapping into where the customers are, there is so much density here in the inland region on this type of uh, global supply chain activities focused on warehousing distribution and transportation that we believe that if we can focus those efforts and get the engagement we can scale and break through some of those really uh crippling uh kind of self-induced uh, mindsets that are holding us back and we won't have to pay for companies to come in from all over the world to set up the factories to just fly in and fly out will have sustainable job growth here locally. Um, and that same approach can be replicated in meaningful verticals in other communities and cities throughout the region and have a network to cross pollinate ideas and to you know, kind of short circuit a lot of the inefficiencies that happen in the innovation process, entrepreneurship process as well. Uh, so then our our accelerator is also related to commerce and logistics or exclusively focused on commerce and logistics in Ontario. Um, and then underpinning that kind of like the co-working and the corporate innovation are providing a consistent thread for ideas to mature from their absolute earliest stages to being implemented and creating and demonstrating market viability uh, and commercialization. Uh, and then, you know, we have a couple of other aspects of that is we have Mobi, which is a mobile innovation and entrepreneurship lab. Um, that is a converted sprinter van that we can go out into the community and engage in meaningful programming, whether it be on STEM or business related topics in a at your doorstep kind of way. And then the last thing is we need individuals that are coming into these spaces to live in reality. We can't have them be in a bubble. And our programs certainly uh, try to prevent people from living in that bubble. We want them to live in reality as much as possible. But this is a component in which we have a coffee shop at the front of the, of the space. It's operated by a local uh, company called Special Needs Coffee and they, um, are focused on autism, uh, behavioral therapies is their parent company. So a percent of all of their sales go to supporting um, individuals with special needs and every single job that is done in the entire company has both um, a lead and an individual with special needs developing transferable life skills so that they can be more independent and more uh, able to contribute in a, in a meaningful way instead of being relegated by society to only do certain things. And so we're really proud and excited that we've been able to, to demonstrate this suite of activities in Ontario. And we absolutely couldn't do it without the support of the city of Ontario. So I wanna make sure that we're, we're giving good and huge props out to Ontario for that. Um, with respect to interface and instantaneous, we will always, our commitment is that we will always have at least um, a percent of all of the cohort. So both of these programs are cohort based and the interface is six months instant, or sorry, yeah, interface is six months, instantaneous is three months. We will always provide non-dilutive, non-fee programming in all of those cohorts. 
so that we can provide access to individuals that really are committed to creating that benefit through innovation and entrepreneurship without worrying about economic means. Now, as far as us selecting Ontario and trying to grow our presence in the inland region is because we have a bias that there's plenty of resources available in Silicon Beach, in Silicon Valley, in Boston, New York, Austin, Miami, go ahead and name all the major hubs. There's plenty of resources, but where there's not is on the outskirts or even deeper away from those. And so if we can provide physical spaces where people are compelled and inspired to pursue their dreams, that's where we're excited and that's where our commitment is to support. So um, I forgot to hit I forgot to hit start on my timer. How are we doing on time? You're good, Kevin. Just a couple more minutes. Okay, so we'll, we'll get into the deliver side real quick. So uh, the biggest thing on the deliver side that I want to go through is if we're all just talking about innovation and entrepreneurship and we're all going out and doing our own individual things, we will never be able to deliver on the promise for this region. We have got to find ways to come together and to execute on these individual and collective initiatives that are happening. And we have to be willing to continue to push on that no matter what. There's people counting on us for, uh, for this to happen. People that we know and many more that we don't. And so it is our responsibility as innovators to deliver on the value of our innovations. It is our responsibility as entrepreneurs to deliver on the promise of our startup or our established business. It is our responsibility as community leaders, governments, non-government agencies, profit, non-profit. It is our responsibility to deliver for those that are counting on us. And that is really what this delivered part is all about. If we just sit around and talk about great ideas and uh, all this amazing stuff that could be, and we're not getting into the dirty, hard, grimy parts of making it real, the floor will drop out. We will not be able to realize the amazing potential that is here in this region and beyond. With that being said, I wanna say, we're constantly learning. And so we're trying to find new pathways to deliver. So we've created last fall, we did the first one. We've got the next one is two days from now is Future Fest. And this is a way for the community to engage in innovation and entrepreneurship in a light and accessible way. So we have arts, we have a culture, um, we've got food and music. We've got uh, kind of this like, mini day of professional development and innovation and entrepreneurship accessibility um, that, we do, that we do now. Um, we have a brand new program that we're launching next month and it's called Elevate Your Side Hustle. One of the things that we've seen is that the programs, the, the formal programs of the incubator and the accelerator and the completely informal access of Beyond Cowork, there's a gap in between there. There's a lot of people in the community that have a lot of entrepreneurial spirit that don't fit neatly into either one of those. And we're offering this new program for free called Elevate Your Side Hustle. And it's really driven on how can you take your either passion or like said, side hustle and actually turn that into a business um, in a very uh, accessible way, not in a, in a formal deep curriculum way. And then, go from there into a more formal program if there's a good fit. And then the last thing is, uh, on the slide at least, is we're expanding into additional verticals. So as we've expanded into uh, Riverside, we are supporting all the verticals in Riverside, life sciences, clean tech, and uh, smart ag, as well as bringing forward one that we're really excited to announce, and that is Justice Tech. So we are focusing a brand new vertical that, that we're gonna carry into the city because of the, the depth of the legal system in Riverside, it's a special place in the region for that focus. And this, there's a lack of uh, density around this topic in the entire country. And so if we can establish it in Riverside, 
that's another compelling advantage of doing business here in the, in the region. And then the last one that we're expanding is in Europe, and it's a biomimicry application of the incubator and the accelerator program. Uh, biomimicry, for those that don't know, is basically learning from nature and being inspired to create solutions to the problems that we face today. Uh, business problems, any of those, uh, technical problems, anything, um, using the lens of nature to do that. So we're super excited on those things. And then we have just two more things I wanna plug is if you or any of the affiliations um, have relationships with universities, on this weekend, we are partnering with uh, the Circular Supply Chain Network to support a hackathon. And this is a global hackathon for students on how to transform uh, two different companies, uh, Cummins, who make uh, big giant engines uh, here in the US, and then um, another company in Europe that does flooring are trying to figure out how to use circular supply chain as a mechanism um, to elevate their, their businesses. And so uh, that hackathon is open for registration right now. And then the last thing is tomorrow night, Excite in Riverside is having their official grand opening at their um, new location right behind Heroes uh, Bar and Grill in, in downtown Riverside and uh, excited for a great night tomorrow night. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a breath. If you didn't tell, I, I get really excited about this. I'm super passionate about innovation. This is what drives me every single day. Um, and it's not the shiny object innovation. It's the like make real value for the world innovation. So thank you all. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was that was really well said. So now we'll um, we'll move into a time of uh, some questions here. I see. Um, Stephen, would you like to start us off here? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for your passion and uh, using your personal um, story as a way to inspire other folks. That's just uh, fantastic to hear. Um, got a question specifically about uh, the, the terminology. Uh, throughout the, the last few years, we've been hearing the word innovation used over and over again, and there are different yeah. definitions for it. And yeah. you know, on your own website, there's a great video um, about the definition of innovation where you said, uh, uh, new is not enough. Can you talk a little bit more about why that's important uh, as a distinction and, and what the distinction is? Yeah, totally. So we'll just start with the definition of innovation that we use. And this is not to say this has to be the golden definition for everyone in the world to use. But we were um, underwhelmed over the years and years of studying innovation by the prevailing definitions. And so the definition that we use is the conversion of creativity into value for stakeholders. And we can go through the details of all of that uh, if there's time. But as far as why new is not, as, not enough um, and, and why we created that video is if we look at the time frame in which innovation was the term was coined, we still thought the world was the center of the universe and it was flat. Yet the persistent thing that's happened with the definition of innovation over that entire period to where we are today is the word new in that definition. And we've learned a lot about the world. We've learned a lot about innovation, but we still hold on to this idea that new has to be at the absolute core of what innovation is. Now, if we look at the, the history of the word, you can understand where it came from and why that may persist, but it's now well studied and uh, it's a formal discipline in many places. And so we should stop thinking about new as being sufficient for innovation. And, and I'd like to do an exercise if everybody would, okay? I want everybody to just uh, think of a word, brand new word, go, think of it. Don't, it, it, and then put it in the chat and hit send. It can't be a word that exists. You're gonna make up the word right now. It doesn't, it doesn't have to mean anything, but just create up a word. I see the chat numbers elevating. Keep going. Oh, there's some good ones. All right, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go with uh, Steven. No, no, uh, who was it uh, that did 
Squemblus. Calvin, I like, I like Skemblus today. That's the one that I like the most. So we all just created something new. Okay. Everyone agree with that? It's a new word, new to you, new to me, new to everybody on this call, but it means absolutely nothing to anybody. There is almost zero value to any of these words. So just the act of creating something new is totally insufficient for innovation to occur. Now, can we take, and, and then even if we go one step before this, so you articulated this word as, um, as an idea, right? In order to, to have your brain possess, you know, process all this information and get it out, you have to have had maybe a thousand other ideas that came through your head that you just filtered through, whether consciously or unconsciously. And then this is the one that you decided to chat into the type in chat. So if, if you want, you can now take this and make it meaningful. You can create value from it, but inherently the act of creating something new is not necessarily valuable. And, and that's what I think gets missed a lot when we're so focused on, oh, anything new is an innovation that we actually detract our ability to deliver on the great promise of innovation. Awesome. Well, thanks, Kevin, for taking us through that exercise. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so uh, something I think that is uh, kind of unique about Fourth Sector is your, the work that you all do with cities. Um, could you expand a little bit about that and talk you know, how you got into that kind of work and some interesting things that you're doing with like local governments? Gary, yeah. one second. I think we're almost having to wrap. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask uh, just one little thing or, or add one little thing before we, we get into another segment, please. Um, <laughs> and I and I love that exercise, Kevin. So again, thank you for taking us through that. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Um, I want to clarify one thing and we'll make sure that we get this out when we send out the report. But um, in last year's report, we we really did, you know, do a kind of overview of, hey, these are the um, the, the the sectors rather uh, in the Inland Empire. And we did identify those. Um, we also wanted to provide some context for the where we've been coming from and where we're going, right? And the where we're going came from a confluence of support around um, uh, industry, university, uh, uh, or you know, consortiums, organizations, et cetera, that we identified in the first report. So not leaving anyone out or saying that any other you know, sectors are, are unimportant because there are great companies here that don't fall into the six sectors that we've identified, right? Um, you know, to call out a few, I mean, we have Monster Energy, we have LuLuLaRoe, we have these big name companies that are, you know, are, are on the stock market, et cetera, that don't fall into any of these. And, 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 and that's not a bad thing. We're, we're saying that we have, um, um, uh, an outpouring of support, um, university R&D, state support, et cetera, that are around certain areas. Um, and the words may 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 uh, confuse. I, uh, logistics clearly falls under clean tech in this air, in, in this uh, uh, instance. But we, we want to make sure that folks know that there's going to be more than just those that have support. Um, all of the incubators, all of the accelerators, all of the technical uh, assistance providers are doing unique things to help address and meet needs in our communities. And we want to you know, be inclusive and highlight those. So those are things that we actually call out program names on when we release the report, for example. Um, there will be both a physical copy and a digital copy that's even more expansive. So there's about three levels of information that we can release showing you know what's happening in the region and this is really just meant to be a, a very high level interview so um or overview rather so thank you all for you know kind of participating in this with us as we try to get out the word of what is the inland empire going to be known for when you look at la and you think of you know uh the creative economy and or you know aerospace and or you know etc what do you think of when you think of the inland empire so we want to start getting that messaging out and start um uh creating that narrative that can be shared alongside uh, major innovation ecosystems like LA, San Diego, Silicon Valley, et cetera, um, alongside just supporting our entrepreneurs in those programs that just to sec, I mean, hello, right? Like putting us on the map for new things. So um, just wanted to add that and I'll turn it over to Gary to close, but thank you, uh, you know, CSI for putting this together and creating this forum for us to meet on a quarterly basis and really share out this information with everyone. Yeah, excellent. And thank you so much, Stacy, for, um, for that clarification. Really appreciate that. So yeah, like Stacy had mentioned, we're we're kind of at time now. So if you do have to go, uh, you know, feel free to to jump off the line. Um, I will hang out for a couple more minutes and um, 
chat with Kevin, um, a couple more questions and just talk through some stuff. But yes, if, if you have to go, uh, thank you so much for coming and, and we'll just be on the line for a little bit. So um, yeah, so uh, Kevin, if you could talk a little bit about that work you've been doing with cities, I think that's really interesting yeah. that isn't being done a lot in the region. So curious about how that came about. I think if we go back, um, we, we didn't have a chance to go through this slide, but this would have helped answer that a bit. Um, and I'll get there one more click. Well, am I, I'm still sharing, right? Yep, you're good. Okay, good. Uh, so if we go back one more, come on now. Well, it's not responding, so I'll just talk through it. But uh, our name, Fourth Sector Innovations, and a tiny little logo there. But uh, this is not terminology that we came up with. So back in I don't know, about a decade ago, I was at a California Forward Economic Summit and was first exposed to this term, fourth sector. And the fourth sector of the economy, if you, if you draw out a four square traditional MBA kind of tool, in the upper left is for profit. In the one one square, that's government. And over on the, the bottom right, that is for profit, or sorry, nonprofit. And so these are the really the three traditional sectors. And the fourth sector is really saying, now what if we took all of these and we really could work in the same direction? What if we were all moving in the same direction? Not coming together and then going back and having our own basic interests trump the ability for collaboration to occur is actively pursuing these ideas uh, dynamically and so that's really the origin of our company and so that really helps answer your question in that we wanted to find uh, great partners and uh, city governments turned out to be one of them um, both from the innovation uh, team you know so we help support driving innovation through city government so that we can get more out of the top, the precious tax dollars uh, and resources that are available in cities. And then also more externally focused uh, departments or agencies within those organizations, economic development. Um, sometimes it's, it's with uh, entire sub areas like smart city development, you know, all of these things on how we then drive accessibility to the community. And I see Jimmy is on. Uh, Jimmy, is, Jimmy Cheng has been uh, one of the biggest supporters of and leaders of innovation in the city of Ontario for um, years. And, and he's been there right from the beginning from when we started uh, our work there. So I think it's a number of things, but if we don't have that engagement directly with the cities, then we're not gonna be able to deliver on the promise of these incredibly powerful things that we espouse to believe in and that is innovation and entrepreneurship yeah yeah that's that's excellent yeah from just from what the the past research that we've done i mean we've been talking with um you know the city of ontario because they are really on it with those like smart city initiatives and programs so um just having them participate it's really great so and, and they've done a lot of really cool stuff so it's really Cool to hear that you all are are connected on some of that so and, and um, we are just to follow like we are elevating up and working at the county level and you know participating at the state level so having these layers of engagement it doesn't mean that we're explicitly focused on city governments but if we are not actively engaging all three traditional sectors in any community that we're supporting we're not going to be able to deliver on that promise that that we believe is there Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, just quickly before we go, is there anything that you want um, that we didn't touch on that you wanted to mention about fourth sector innovations? There is one important thing, especially considering the forum that we're in, um, you know, being around social innovation. Our parent company, the company we started when I left the Boeing company, is called the WeC Collective. And WeC is an acronym wellness, education, society, ethics, and the environment. And it's our goal with that company and everything under it, which fourth sector is under it, 
uh, is to find and foster those that are trying to create value in a broader context than just profit. And we think that's the future of business in general. Um, and that is what we build in. We have every one of our incubator and accelerator cohorts, all the teams in there commit to looking at value beyond profit in order to be in the program. And so we're not just talking about it, we're actively trying to find meaningful ways to think about value in a broader context. Great, that's, that's awesome. That's a, that's a great way to wrap it up. I really appreciate it, Kevin. Thank you again. Um, and for, for everyone that joined us today, I know it's being live streamed, so there might be some people watching on Facebook as well. So, um, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to be with us today. Our next showcase is going to be sometime at the end of summer or early fall. Um, we don't have a date yet, but we'll definitely let you know. We'll also be releasing that uh, report update very soon, which we will share out with everyone. And of course, uh, please feel free to download and read our original um, report last year that's on the website. And um, thank you again. Please feel free to reach out with any questions. And um, yeah, I, I had a blast today listening to everyone. So thank you all. I appreciate it. So take thank care, you. everybody.